Hey, and welcome back to another video. And today I want to talk about contested zones and asteroid bases. Now, recently on the uh, latest episode of Star Citizen Live, the devs went over in more detail what we should expect when Pyro comes in 4.0. And we got some pretty interesting information. So I wanted to kind of jump around this video and go over some of the key questions that I think was asked and uh, talk about the answers that the devs gave. So without further ado, let's get right into this video. Contested zones and asteroid bases. Um, how widely spread are these contested zones and asteroid bases around the Pyro system? Um, the Pyro system is pretty darn big. So what, 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 are we, what are we talking about as far as how, how far these are spread? So um, currently we are planning for about five contested zones, and these are in a select a few stations, uh, all pretty evenly spread along the power system. Some of them uh, being in very specific places uh, that are only be able to be accessed once you progress uh, to a specific stage, or once you have actually gained a couple items, you can get to that location and unlock the interior, basically. So, multi contestant zones might not be immediately accessible to the player. Um, there is some that will require you to complete others to, to then find the keys to others, basically. Or to... Okay, so, so far, it sounds like that these contested zones that they're talking about are kind of like Ghost Hollow how or or Jump Town. And I think that's something that CAG wants to do more of moving forward in the future. There are essentially locations in the game that have specific gameplay, like uh, Security Post Korea, for instance, where this location has a specific use case in the, in the universe. But these locations do seem a little bit more gamified and it doesn't seem like that there's as big of a reason law wise for them to exist now uh, uh strictly speaking they could just be various gang hideouts where you can infiltrate and get various gang items but right now it just kind of seems like uh CAG is just trying to put in different types of content in the game. I don't have a problem with this. I don't have a problem with them trying new things. I want them to. Um, but I do want to know a little bit more about these locations, uh, actual functionality in the game. What is their utility? Uh, kind of what purpose do they serve for the overall overarching universe rather than you know just a place where players can farm different things and we'll get into what you can uh find at these locations will there be asteroid bases without enemy npcs or non-violent gameplay as well uh for example scavenging okay. environmental puzzles rescue missions finding missing people is there something to do in asteroid bases for players who just want to bring peace to the galaxy I'm not sure about peace, um, <laughs> but <laughs> but yes, certainly. Um, the current intention and goal we have uh, in developing these is like, as previously touched on a bit before, is, uh, the encounter ones are solely the sandbox environment for the whole mission stuff. So people who want to engage in missions and want to engage in combat and do these things. Um, but I also want to have this like more safer spaces. I mean. You can't um, pre prevent PvP from happening, obviously, but the exploration ones are more dedicated to um, solving puzzles and finding like rewards by entering rooms that are not so obviously like um, enterable, right? Like you have to do some things, uh, hack it, and not hack a door, but um, find means uh, for, uh, around the space and then get more like higher uh, rewards in there. Gotcha. Um, so yes, that's like. No, no NPCs and uh, so anything is planned in there. Manuel, can you, can you give me a, a, a big like heroic pose? Something. Like okay, so it kind of seems interesting to me because uh, it's not entirely clear the delineation between contested zones and asteroid bases. I think what they're referring to here 
is that there are asteroid bases that have uh, non-combat elements to them. But from my understanding, all contested zones will have some level of combat and NPCs and different things in them. And contested zones could be right outside of, you know, uh, the habitat area at space stations. And um, this was another thing that they talked about on ISC, where you could essentially just be at a, uh, you know, at a station in Pyro and you kind of get a mission to go to an area and like clear out some bad guys. During the Pyro playground, there was this kind of area, this kind of FPS area where you had a mission to go and clear out NPCs. And it, it was a really cool area. And the FPS gameplay there was, you know, it was amazing. There was a lot of cover. It was very atmospheric. I enjoyed it a lot. And I think that that is kind of probably what the template for contested zones is going to be like. Um, so you, you essentially have, uh, you know, content right outside of your doorstep if you so choose. But with asteroid bases, I think that uh, they might be a little bit different. Again, I'm not entirely sure, but it sounds like that, you know, asteroid bases will, you know, be a little bit more varied in the types of content that you'll be able to find there. What group sizes are contested zones designed around? This is a great question. Uh, yeah. We definitely, like, you can do it solo, but uh, okay. we wouldn't recommend that. You can like do it solo. Like John just said earlier, these are pretty PvP, PvE-centric spaces. Even if you were, there were no players uh, in your vicinity, you'll still face quite the challenge. So our recommendation is to at least go with one friend. Uh, we are currently envisioning, like, a, or in our test at least, we are going in by four, by f uh, five player groups. Uh, so, in my opinion, that sounds pretty good. Content for groups is important. Again, because they plan on making this an MMO, they have been using the word MMO a lot more lately. Um, I think that these will kind of work like, you know, Star Citizen's Dungeons, that I think that word has been thrown around a bit uh, when referring to this type of content. And if you have three other friends, two other friends, and you want to go in there and face up against other groups, uh, face up against NPCs, that seems like that would be a fun experience. Doing something like this solo, I feel like would potentially be pretty stressful because if you get down or something like that, you wouldn't have anyone in your crew that would be able to revive you. So, um, uh, going at least with one other person, in my opinion, in that type of scenario, if you find something real and you want to get out of there um, and you get down for some reason, having someone else with you, again, will give you that ability to get revived and you can actually make it out. Your, your chances of success when, when bringing other people to content like this just gets increased. And I think a lot of content in Star Citizen can be done solo. But again, what I think CRG wants to do with the content is make it so that you can ultimately do it solo, but your chances of success improves the more, the more people you bring with you. And that again, makes it more, that makes it feel more like an MMO that, uh, the content is designed for larger groups. But again, at the end of the day, MMOs are, you know, things that a lot of people want to do solo. And if the there's like different areas in the contested zone like where like the first opening area is a little bit easier it has a little bit less obstacles um and it has a little bit less rare and unique items that section might be more soloable and then as you go deeper in the contested zone it might get more difficult you might find more groups of players fighting over um you know more rare loot so if they put the least real loot in the first room, for instance, let's, let's say it's a dungeon and there's like five rooms. If they put the least real stuff in the first room and the most real stuff in the fifth room, then most people, most groups will try to get to the fifth room 
And even though that first room might be kind of dangerous because that's where a lot of people are coming into it, most people are going to probably fight over that fifth room. So if you're doing it solo, that first room might be easier to do. And then maybe the second and third room is for like a group of one or two. And then that fifth room is really like 4v4 type uh, gameplay. So I think that's an interesting design uh, to make it kind of linear like that. Um, and I think it's good that CIG is planning for, uh, you know, these different kind of groups. Like he said that, uh, in their testing that they're kind of looking at, uh, you know, multiple players with the content right from the beginning. That's super important. Will asteroid bases appear as quantum markers always, or as exploration mission, uh, or as exploration stuff necessary to travel to them? This is not a great question. No, it's uh, they will be always there, always present for you. I said um, you ca can also go to them uh, if there's no mission running, even the, send the mission sandbox he wants, the encounter asteroid bases. You can travel there without requiring requiring a mission. There will be AI population regardless. It's uh, the mission stuff will t uh, add on top of that. But all of them um, you can see from the get go. There now might be plan plans for the future that's um, what i wanted to get at that's certain you're speaking about how it is in 4.0 in our initial release okay. um anybody that can remember uh the initial release of the pu the stand system back in no late november early december 2015 uh and you look at that version of the stand system versus the version of the stand system you have now obviously these things change these things grow over time pyro will be no different even as we continue even as we continue to add star system after star system after star system after that okay. we're not our intention is never to abandon the previous ones. There are new stuff coming to Stanton in 4.0. We haven't gotten to talking about that yet, but uh, it'll be on ISC in a couple of weeks. Nice. But 4.0 isn't just all pyro and we forget Stanton. So it's we're talking about st pyro as it is in 4.0, but the uh, obviously as we continue to introduce more exploration-based ships, everybody knows the uh, Zeus is, is on. Okay, so I'm gonna pause right there, basically, the straightforward answer to the question is in 4.0, these will have quantum markers. You will be able to go to them at all times. You do not need a mission to go to these locations. They will have NPC populations roaming around. So there's always going to be content for you to do there. Again, uh, I, I would say kind of like Ghost Hollow or Security Post Korea. I think that the initial plan for these locations is to be you know, uh, readily available content for the players. So they can go and they can kind of uh, just go straight to whatever action they want to get into. But like Jared is saying here in the future, they want to uh, have some of these areas uh, that are a little bit off the beaten path that explorers and, you know, more adventurous people in the community can go to and find. And they can discover and they can say, hey, there is kind of this this asteroid base, this derelict asteroid base out here in this asteroid field. And here are the coordinates. Perhaps, you you know, if you're an explorer, you can sell that information. I think that, um, uh, again, I really don't know how that's going to work because at the end of the day, the internet exists. And, uh, you know, you might sell that information to somebody who just puts it online. And then, you know, a lot of people can find that information and it's not really valuable anymore. So, I think it's really going to come down the community when people are talking about that, when people are talking about exploration or, or selling information is that because the game is, uh, so handcrafted, uh, again, it's, it's way more handcrafted than I ever expected it to be. Um, I expected there to be, you know, some procedural content in the game, even if the, the star system is static and handcrafted that some of the content would still at least be procedural. That way there would be stuff to find and explore. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that a lot of this stuff is going to be static and because of the internet that, uh, you know, people are just going to be able to share coordinates and stuff like that. And CRG has said in the past that they want to add that functionality to the map, the in-game map. So you could drop pins and share that with people. And I think that, uh, realistically is going to be kind of the best thing for explorers and not until that feature comes online do I really feel like exploration is going to kind of uh, scratch the itch that a lot of people are waiting for to be scratched 
uh, you the ability to say, okay, I found this location. I'm going to drop a pin here on the map. That turns into coordinates in your map system. And then you can share that with someone else. They put those coordinates in. It puts a pin and they can quantum right to it. I think that that's going to be valuable because at the end there you could share coordinates like, uh, you know, point at OM2 or whatever. And that does work to be able to find things, but it's just not the same as a quantum marker. So I think there will be value in, uh, you know, an explorer going out there and finding something and getting those coordinates and selling that quantum marker to other players in the game. I think that will be valuable. But again, until we get that, I think that uh, having these locations be static, have content available at all times, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially uh, for the first iteration in 4.0. Yeah. Why, why, why did we do these by hand instead of using the procedural tools? Okay, so this makes sense based on what I was talking about. I think there's always balance to be had with how you, how much you do stuff procedural versus how much you want to control the general flow of things. So we're talking like procedural, like in our terms, this used to be a lot like you stitch a room one by one together based on kind of some parameters and logic. But that kind of eliminates our our ability to handcraft an experience that flows throughout a multi-room setup, right? So what we're looking at right now instead is is hand stitching certain sections together that that can combine into kind of like a gameplay bubble, and then utilizing multiple game gameplay bubbles that we can then stitch together with this procedural tool, right? So we have a bit more control on the scale of things that is a bit larger than just the room, but right. accommodates for multiple rooms, basically. And that, that's in line with, that's in line with, with things we've said before. I mean, there, there, there are game, there are other games out there who very famously, everything is procedural. And, and yeah. some, and some of the struggle of that is that nothing is really unique because of that. Um, and no, I'm not talking about the one. Now, I don't think that's fair because I think there's a good and a bad way to do it. Honestly, um, I think what a lot of people, and especially like I was saying recently, just before this clip, um, expected there to be, uh, templates essentially. So you have a bunker template, right? And you procedurally create that you have a, uh, distribution center template and you procedurally generate that. You have an outpost template and then you procedurally generate that. So basically you have this, and they've showed us this before where they have like a zoo of assets. And then you put all those zoos into all of these templates. So you say this location can have X, Y, Z structures and the, the procedural generation technology, I don't know how it works or whatever. Th that technology will say ra at random, it will have this room, it will have that room, it will have that uh, reward, it will have whatever. And the procedural generation tech pulls from those assets that the de developers have handcrafted and it spits out unique content. Um, but again, I think that that makes a lot of sense for some other games. I think Star Citizen, because of, uh, again, maybe part of realism, part of narrative, uh, there are a lot of different factors. Um, yes, a system like that might be helpful to create uh, some kind of location, for instance, on a surface of a planet in space. But ultimately, this location needs to be replicatable. Every time somebody visits this location, they need to be like, I need to be able to go to the same place that you can go to, and you need to be able to go to the same place that I can go to. So once they create something, it's, it's in the verse essentially. And it's not like, okay, I can choose to uh, you know, go to a location that no one else can get to because this location is procedurally generated, if that makes any sense. And again, different games do this differently, but, uh, at the end of the day, 
that type of procedural tech would only exist to help the developers develop faster, not exist to actually create content. They could procedurally generate uh, shipwrecks uh, where you have a ship wrecked on a planet right now, what they do is they, they, they hand place that stuff. Um, but they could come up with a system that's like, okay, there's 10 shipwrecks on this moon, go explore it. You know, they put it, the, the procedural tech puts NPCs. And I think that makes more sense for the way the game is designed for them to say, yes, okay, we're procedurally generating, uh, ships in different locations, uh, derelict ships in different locations. And eventually more stuff can come online like that, where they say, okay, we're procedurally generating this homestead or we're procedurally generating this little mining operation going on on this planet, because those are things where, you know, NPCs could go do something, pack up and then leave, or, uh, you know, if you're, if an NPC is flying around and accidentally crashes, then you get a wreck. It, it, there's a realistic likelihood that this thing is, would be temporary, kind of like transient jump points. There's a realistic reason why transient jump points are temporary or, or, you know, why they wouldn't be there for everyone, essentially. What kind of rewards are there? from the contested zones. Is there a shared PVP mission item to recover or are there loot small enough to carry in a backpack example? Obviously. Okay, this is a very interesting question and uh, you know, probably the most interesting thing about this live because what CAG said was that these locations will have rewards and I think the community collectively just looked at their screen and asked themselves rewards, what rewards? Nothing has value in this game. So this is the interesting part that I want to hear them talk about. We don't want to spoil everything. We, 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 want, we still want some level of discovery, but as much as you can share, what, what, are, what are people working towards in a contested zone? Um, I guess I can give some examples. So for the first part, what kind of rewards you're going to get is, first, our first step is to make things unavailable like widely unavailable something that you just can't not get from the shops in stanton or in pyro it has to be something that is only be uh, retrievable right here and what we're looking at right now after talking with system design about it and and other people is that ship components are, are, are one one of the big steps like that like military stealth okay there you guys go you have it they are talking about unique items. Now, this is something that I've said in my previous videos, my videos about Star Citizen's economy, is that this is the key point that developers need to focus on moving forward to make Star Citizen a game, is that they need to create tiers of items and delineate their uses in the game, delineate their availab availability in the game. Essentially, you'll have items that you could buy with real money in the store, items that you could buy with in-game uh, money in shops, and then items that you cannot buy anywhere, not with real money, not with in-game money. And that is where the game is going to really start because then players can grind these locations to get these items some of the best items in the game and they can turn around and sell those unique items to other players for a lot of money. You could make money doing this, or you could just keep the real item for yourself, but it creates an economy for the players. If you could buy everything in the shop, you're not going to buy an item from another player. If you could buy with real money, you're not going to buy it from another player. You need to create a unique item that you have to buy from another player. And then we'll get that player economy that this game so desperately needs. People with the Banu Merchantman, people with the Kraken Privateer. These ships are designed as shops. So 
players will need to have a lot of items, a lot of unique items that can't be purchased anywhere uh, that they can sell at these locations. And this is another great use case for procedurally generated tech. And I said this in another one of my videos where CIG could essentially create a system where there is a catalog of gun parts and different assets and the AI essentially just puts these things together and makes a unique item. Let's say they take a gun skin, a scope, a suppressor, um, and these different aspects and they make a completely unique gun that you can only find at this location by doing certain content. Then players, they go out there, they do the content, they farm this weapon, and they turn around and they sell it to other players, or they keep it as a trophy. Um, at the end of the day, I think that, again, the most exciting part about unique items for me is the player economy, because that's something that I want. I want this game to have a robust player economy, because that, in my opinion, is the real progression in Star Citizen, is contributing and being a part of a player economy. This is sandbox MMO after all and all good sandbox MMOs need some type of deep player progression player to player progression player to player economy that's where the game is really going to start to be exciting to me again jumping in and doing content especially if it's in a buggy state a lot of people are not going to have the will to keep up with that forever but if they have a real reason to do things because they need you know x y and z to make something, i.e. crafting, or uh, again, crafting goes hand in hand with the unique items. So I hope that CAG prioritizes this. This is great to hear from the team that they're finally thinking about this, focusing on this, uh, putting these items in to Pyro. And again, if you want to go to Pyro and farm out unique and rare stuff and bring them back to Stanton, again, that that adds to the player economy that could be so interesting in this game. Certain items being only available in certain star systems. And so you have traders going to different star systems to sell those items where for more money, where it's even more rare. So, uh, you know, I like this. I'm excited about this idea. This episode of Star Citizen Live talks about other things and goes into other things in more detail, but I'm going to stop it here. If you guys want to watch this episode of Star Citizen Live for yourself, I'll leave a link in the video description. Thanks so much for hanging out with me again, you guys. I know that, uh, you know, big things on the horizon. This is just kind of the slow point in the community right now. I'm enjoying uh, uh, 3.24. I think that uh, it's not a bad patch, but it is, uh, it's a lot smaller. I think that, CIG was a bit too ambitious with 323. Um, and I think that uh, kind of some of the half-baked ideas in 324 is just more evidence of that. Um, and of course, uh, item banks and personal inventory is still a uh, topic of contention. I think that uh, that uh, that whole scenario is very half-baked and I feel like um, I don't know maybe CIG needs to get more Evo Cardi feedback about this stuff before like like have Evo Cardi look at the UI that they're planning to put out get feedback on it before you start developing it so there's like a pre Evo Cardi phase where the developers tell the Evo Cardi what they want to do before they start developing it I think that would save them a lot of time and a lot of trouble. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a content creator on YouTube. But thanks for hanging out with me again. Uh, that's going to be it for this video. You guys, like I always say at the end of these videos, like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Salute.